eating out will never be the same again. I've got a night off work. I'm getting to... This is pretty good. Funk about the whole funk and nothing but about the funk. I started doing that at the end of a lot. Thank you. I need a straw for that for obvious reasons. You're a weirdo. <laughs> The guilt-free eavesdropping. The new series of Diners tonight at 11.30 on BBC Choice. And for all the chat in full, go to Diners Interactive. Going underground in the Peak District, songs of praise. In 40 minutes here on BBC One, now more of your points of view. Hello and welcome to Points of View. Terry's off this week doing a bit of tiling and grouting and he's left the programme hopefully in my safe hands. I will do my best not to break it. But he didn't unfortunately leave me the keys to Points of View Towers so I'm slumming it in my central London pied-à-terre. This week we're escaping from elephants, going behind the scenes with DL and Pasco, and taking a look at meerkats, holidays and religion, as you do. But first, Mr Trebus. Yes, last Sunday's programme about the life of grime hero Mr Trebus had you calling and emailing big time. The inside of the house was now fuller than ever. In fact, no one knew whether the rubbish was causing the structural problems or was the only thing holding the house up. Inside the house I can only get here into this kitchen and climb over this heap and right in the opposite corner there, uh, there's a, a, a bed underneath but I don't even know up to now whether my television is still there. The Edmund Trebus special was one of the best programmes I've ever watched. Hilarious yet moving. Thank you for some decent Sunday night TV. At last. A great story about a Polish war veteran who had a lot of spirit and courage in what he believes in. Yes, he made you laugh and he made you cry. You all loved Mr. Trebus. I found it not only hilarious but also very moving. Well done. I'm sorry that I'm still alive. It would have been less painful to have been falling somewhere on the frontier during the war in France or in Italy. That's all I can say. That's a very moving film. A new series of Life of Grime is currently in production. Now, many of you wrote in to say how much you loved Alid Jones on Songs of Praise last week. Songs of Praise with Alid Jones and Friends was a beautiful programme. Alid is a natural for the show. I believe in a world that's giving a love with a man But alas, many of you are concerned that things on Songs of Praise ain't what they used to be. Ali Jones, a pop festival? Please get back to the Christian ideas of praise. What is the deal with Songs of Praise? Sometimes it's really good, and sometimes it's just meaningless. Don't let religious programming degenerate into singing with scenery. Well, we went to the top. We asked Alan Bookbinder, BBC's Head of Religion and Ethics, Where's the praise gone in Songs of Praise? The purpose of Songs of Praise hasn't changed. It's a programme of music and testimony inspired by the Christian message. And hymns are very much at the heart of that. Alid sang uh, Bread of Heaven, he sang How Great Thou Art, the nation's favourite hymn in last week's programme. But the thing is that many people, especially younger people, didn't sing hymns at school and they don't have that same sense of recognition, of nostalgia at the hymns. So, alongside the music of the cathedral and the church, we're introducing some music more associated with the concert hall, music with a, a modern feel. 
But the important thing is that even that music has to have a connection with the Christian message. It has to speak of hope, of joy, of love, of compassion. Very much true to Songs of Praise Christian tradition. So religion is alive and well on Songs of Praise, just moving forward. Now on a very different note, but still on a musical one, we enter the world of murder and mayhem in detective drama D.L. and Pasco. Another decent programme ruined. D.L. and Pasco. Unrelenting, unnecessary, inappropriate and over loud music. How does the Alan Pascoe get away with showing a dead body before the watershed? I admire the Yorkshire scenery in the Alan Pascoe, but my husband tells me it's not filmed in Yorkshire. Is this true? Surely not. We went on set with the Alan Pascoe to find out about the music, the location and... Some of you find the level of music on the Alan Pascoe intrusive, but the BBC do have set levels which are not allowed to exceed. 590, take one. Action! I'm very interested to hear that many of you were puzzled as to how we managed to show D.L. and Pasco, which is a crime detective series which involves many dead bodies before nine o'clock, which is pre-watershed. In fact, it is quite difficult, but if you watch closely, you will see that we never really like the fact that lots of children watch D.L. and Pasco, and we like the fact that they can watch it with their parents, and we would never want to offend. Very quiet, please. Do, uh... Oxfordshire, the Cotswolds, um, anywhere that we think might look like a Yorkshire village or Yorkshire hills and uh, we've been getting away with that for the last seven years and people think it's Yorkshire because we say it's Yorkshire. Blackstone wasn't too friendly. This is Yorkshire, Bubba. Goes without saying. And all the interiors are mainly done in Birmingham because the show is based out of BBC Birmingham and uh, so that's the trick we play on the audience and hopefully they still I think they do showbiz really well as he says that's showbiz and you can't always believe what you see which prompted one of our viewers to wonder about a particular scene on Sunday night's natural history documentary escape the elephants the program tested the theory that elephants can track the human scent of poachers I enjoyed escape the elephants very much however since seeing is no longer believing how do we know the chase was not fiction So, we asked executive producer Fiona Pitcher if what we saw was real. That chase was definitely for real, although it is so amazing what those elephants did, it is hard to believe, and they are truly amazing elephants. What we did was film the chase over seven hours. We had one crew on Sarah Douglas Hamilton, our presenter, and one crew with the Ellis all the time. Sometimes our crew with Saba were really, really running non-stop, and every now and then they tried to just get a little bit ahead to get those shots that you saw at key moments of Saba. And sometimes, occasionally, the Ellie crew would go ahead in a vehicle if they could make a good guess as to where the Ellies were going to go next. One of the things that we did film once that chase was over were the aerials. We certainly didn't want to have a helicopter hovering over our elephants for seven hours. It would really have disturbed them and possibly put them off the trail, which was the very last thing we wanted. But we wanted to have them so the audience could get a geography and a sense of what was happening. But that's the thing that we did film after the chase was over. Fascinating programme. We received lots of emails on that one, as I'm sure you would appreciate. Now, on these cold, dark winter nights, there's nothing like watching the sea, sand and sunshine on a holiday programme. But many of you feel holiday you call the shots is not a relaxing walk on the beach. Firstly, you found the camera work far too frenetic. Rapid moving camera shots meant we couldn't actually see the beauty of Venice. It gave us a headache trying to watch it. Yours dizzily. Well, who wants to laze by a TV and drink cocktails with all that going on? What? And it wasn't just the presenters that didn't give you that holiday feeling. A trio of very silly and infantile presenters prancing about making stupid faces and even more stupid banter. What you see on screen is suggested by our audience, by the viewers. On a Monday evening, we appeal for suggestions from our viewers. The following Monday, you see those come to life on air. So we've got three presenters in a city working very hard to 
try and cover as many of your great suggestions as possible. That means that inevitably a lot of it is shot handheld in a fast way. It's turned around and edited in a fast, quick manner. Sometimes you suggest some rather bizarre things too. For instance, last week, her old Joe Mace was asked to lie down in St. Mark's Square and get pecked by pigeons. Now, Joe really didn't want to do that, but we rose to our viewers' challenge and went out there and covered it. Go away! If you want to ask a question or share your TV thoughts, then write to us at POV, BBC Birmingham, Birmingham B5 7QQ. You can call us on 0121 472 7988 or email us at pov at bbc.co.uk. Now, one of the cutest things on TV last week has to be an episode of The Natural World featuring our old friend, the Meerkats. So many of you wrote in and called about that programme. Fantastic, wonderful, marvellous. I cannot say enough good things about the programme. The sequence that had me rocking with laughter was the sleepy meerkats literally dropping off. Please, may we see it again. So, for all those fans of the fluffy ones, hang on one second, they are on their way. I'll say goodbye. Terry's back next week in more palatial surroundings. Till then. That was great. Do you mean great in the sense that Winston Churchill was great? And let's not forget Henry VIII. And Charles Dickens. Yeah, what about Sir Isaac Newton? Charles Darwin. David Beckham. Lord Nelson died for his country. And Elizabeth the First, who was married to it. John Lennon! Sir Paul McCartney. What about Alfred the Great? Who is the greatest Britain of all time, and what makes them so great? Great Britain's The Great Debate, tonight at 9 on BBC Two. Who will you vote for?